This video was brought to you by Brilliant. On Monday, the UK's Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron, announced that the UK would be imposing sanctions on China after it emerged that Chinese state-affiliated organisations had hacked into the UK Electoral Commission's systems sometime between 2021 and 2022. Now, this is a remarkable U-turn from both the UK and Cameron personally, who less than a decade ago declared a golden era for UK-China relations, and even invited Xi Jinping down to the pub to celebrate. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how UK-China relations have deteriorated over the past 10 years or so, what's driven this change, and what could happen next. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So, to understand quite how dramatic the decline in UK-China relations have been, you have to go back to the early 2010s, when now Foreign Secretary David Cameron was Prime Minister. During his premiership, Cameron's foreign policy was more guided by what he saw as the UK's economic interests rather than its geopolitical or strategic interests. This is why Cameron's first two foreign visits when he became Prime Minister were to Turkey and India, two big, growing economies that Cameron thought could be vital trade partners for the UK. Well, he changed his tune during the Brexit referendum, saying that Turkey wouldn't join the EU until the year 3000. At the beginning of his premiership, Cameron was actually one of the loudest advocates for Turkish accession into the EU. In 2010, only a month after taking office, Cameron gave a speech warning France and Germany not to shut Turkey out of the club, which didn't go down too well with either then-French President Nicolas Sarkozy or German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Anyway, Cameron's myopic focus on economic interests over strategic concerns was most apparent in his dealings with China. That's because Cameron saw China as a massive economic opportunity, both because it was obviously an enormous and growing economy, but also because in the 2010s, China was trying to internationalize the yuan to partially replace the dollar in international trade. For context, the US dollar is what's known as the world's reserve currency, which basically means it's the currency that governments, central banks, and other financial institutions hold in their reserve, and is therefore the default currency for international trade. Now, China didn't like the dollar's role as the world's reserve currency, both because it made China in some sense financially dependent on the US, which became clear during the 2008 financial crisis, and also because demand for dollars as reserve assets allows the US government to borrow tons of money, which irritated China. So in the 2010s, China tried to get other countries to start using their currency in international trade by doing things like providing swap lines to foreign central banks and loaning out yuan at cheap rates to countries that would take it. Anyway, Cameron saw massive opportunity here, because he thought the city of London, which already had strong ties to Chinese finance via Hong Kong, could help China with the internationalization of the yuan. In keeping with this, Cameron put a lot of effort into developing a commercial relationship with China, negotiating billion-pound joint investment deals and signing the UK up to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, a Chinese development bank that was sort of an accessory to the One Belt, One Road initiative. There were even rumours that the UK was planning to join the BRI and use Chinese money to fund the Northern Powerhouse Initiative, which was basically the precursor to Boris Johnson's levelling up programme. Anyway, as you probably already know, this policy collapsed over the next few years or so, for at least three reasons. Firstly, Brexit. By ruining the UK's relationship with Europe, Brexit forced the UK to move closer to America, because well, America and Europe are basically the UK's two main allies. So, budding up with America was basically the only way that the UK could maintain a degree of geopolitical relevance, and a free trade deal with America was touted by Brexiteers as a sort of replacement to the EU single market. Secondly, America toughened its stance on China. Obama was already irritated by Cameron's China policy, but Trump took an even harder line on China than his predecessor did, which Biden has mostly continued. It's since become clear that it would be very difficult for the UK to have a friendly relationship with both America and China, considering the bipartisan anti-China consensus in Washington. But thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is China's crackdown on Hong Kong that began in earnest in 2019. 
Then Prime Minister Boris Johnson responded by accusing China of failing to respect the one country, two systems arrangement agreed at the end of the British colonial rule in 1997 and led to the creation of a bespoke route for the 5.4 million Hong Kongers with British overseas national status, much to Beijing's irritation. Now, this was a sharp shift for Johnson, who previously described himself as fervently Sinophile, and saw a relatively close relationship with China in the early months of his premiership. But what happened in Hong Kong had a uniquely negative impact on China's relationship with the UK, in a way that it didn't on China's relationship with other European countries. And that largely explains why the UK has gone from being arguably the most pro-China country in Western Europe in 2015 to arguably the most anti-China country today. Relations have deteriorated even further over the last few months, after a number of reports have suggested that China is pursuing an enormous espionage operation inside the UK, and that state-affiliated groups hacked into the UK's Electoral Commission database. You get the idea then. China and the UK have gone from being almost friends to almost enemies in the last decade. So what's the prognosis for the Sino-British relationship? Can it recover? Well, in the short term, it's hard to imagine, given the enduring memory of both Hong Kong and China's hyper-aggressive diplomacy during the pandemic. However, in the medium term, it is at least possible. A geopolitical split is emerging between America and Europe on the question of China, with most of Europe unwilling to follow America's hyper-hawkish lead. If the UK decides to lean more towards Europe in the future, which is easy to imagine if Trump and Starmer win their respective elections this year, then it's at least possible to imagine a softening in Sino-British relations, in tandem with the rest of Europe. Now, understanding what exactly is going to happen here is a little tricky, requiring you to evaluate a lot of different information from often partial sources. It'll be sensible then to begin improving your own critical thinking skills so that you can stay sharp and better understand what's going on. And, well, our sponsor, Brilliant.org, can help you do exactly that. Brilliant is the online learning platform that's designed specifically to teach you everything from maths, data analysis, programming, and AI from the ground up. You don't need a fancy degree or to have dedicated hundreds of hours to studying any of these topics. All you need is a device with an internet connection and a spare few minutes a day. And with those few minutes, you'll be learning by actually doing. Because Brilliant allows you hands-on lessons that allow you to play around with concepts a method that has been shown to be six times more effective than just watching lectures. What makes this even better is that this content is created by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, and more. You can try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by clicking the link in the description. That way, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.